Hello, this is episode 368. My name is Leanne Vogel. I'm a functional blood chemistry specialist, holistic nutritionist, and clearly the host of the Keto Diet Podcast, Derp. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you here today. This is going to be a good one. Um, we've been chatting a little bit about DNA and our genes and what this means. And so there was this disconnect between what my DNA report was saying and what I know knew to be true based on my functional blood chemistry. And I started researching just how just because your DNA says something doesn't necessarily mean that you need that something. And so it's really a balance between what the blood chemistry is saying to then what your DNA says. And that's when I got into nutritional epigenetics, which is kind of the flip of this. Okay, so I wanted to have Dr. Aronica on, who's a lecturer at the Stanford Prevention and Research Center and R&D lead genomics at Metagenics, Inc. Her research and teaching focus on how lifestyle can change gene expression through a process called epigenetics and how we can use this information to design personalized lifestyle interventions for optimal health and longevity. Some topics of her courses include nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics, intermittent fasting and ketogenic diets, the role of these interventions in personalized lifestyle medicine and longevity medicine. Lucia has 15 plus years of research experience from the University of of Oxford, the University of Vienna, the University of Federico II of Naples, the University of Southern California, Stanford University. She has published research papers in top-ranked peer-reviewed journals such as JAMA, Cell, and Genes and Development. Basically, she's brilliant, and it's pretty awesome that she's coming on the show today to chat with us. We tried to really keep the conversation simple, like try saying epigenetics 10 times fast, right? So I really just wanted to get down to the basics so that if you've done DNA testing or you have questions about this and you're not really sure how it relates, you can glean some information from today's episode. So let's get to today's interview. Hi, Dr. Aronica. How are you? I'm really, I'm doing well and thank you. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, Leanne, for this invitation. Yes, of course. We have been planning this episode probably for like eight months. So I'm glad that we could make this happen. <laughs> um, so why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yes, my name is uh, Lucia Aronica. I'm uh, a lecturer at Stanford University. Uh, where I do research and I teach classes about the science of nutritional epigenetics. That uh, This is a scary name, uh, but uh, this is uh, actually a very friendly science. It's the science of how food uh, can be medicine. So how food as medicine works at the molecular level how our diet can uh, impact uh, the function of our genes and with it our health and longevity. And um, I also teach um, classes on uh, um, ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting, and I'm actually planning to teach some of these classes live on my own teaching platform. So I will be sharing um, a sign up uh, to my newsletter so people can uh, uh, can sign up for uh, any to get notified when I launch the course. I am also passionate about democratizing the science of healthy eating by, by making the complex easy actionable and fun. And that's why uh, teaching uh, is uh, one of my greatest passion, because I think that science can be very complicated, but can also be uh, broken down in uh, small bites that are accessible to everybody. And science can help people live a healthier, longer life. And I'm here for to facilitate this, uh, this, uh, this translation process from the complex to the easy to the actionable and fun. 
Great. And so when it comes to nutritional epigenetics, does one need to have like a DNA test and understand what their genes are in order to kind of delve deep into this? Thanks for asking this question. This is one of the most frequent questions I get from my students who sign up for my courses. My courses teach also about nutrigenetics, which is what you are asking about. So how our genes can modify the way we respond to food. I'm talking about food allergies, but also whether we uh, uh, can uh, absorb uh, some nutrients, how much uh, of these nutrients we can absorb. For example, how much folate we can activate and use from the spinach we eat, right? This is also influenced by our genes. This is nutrigenetics. So is uh, the first part of the equation in the field of nutritional genomics. So is uh, genes affect the way we respond to food. The flip side of that is nutritional epigenetics, which is how the food we eat can affect how our genes work in the cell. So it's the opposite, it's the flip side. So my course teaches both parts and basically tells you, okay, you have these genes and these genetic predispositions. This is your baseline. This is your start line in your journey to a healthier you. But then really the race, the path is the flip side, is the nutritional epigenetics, is a, the food choices you, may, you make every day and can impact the way your genes work. And actually, this makes 75% of the equation. So the flip side is more important. Most people now focus on the genetics, and, uh, but actually that's the, the, the opposite of what we should be doing, like focusing on what matters most because we can make sure we control our genes by focusing on the epigenetics, on the choices we make and that can impact how our genes work in a cell. After all, think about that. I will make a practical example. There are some genes that can uh, predispose uh, people to have a higher chance to get uh, breast cancer. I think uh, some uh, uh, women in your audience may be familiar with the, with a gene called BRCA1. And uh, because Angelina Jolie was a carrier of the risk variant of that gene, and then decided to do like a, bre a preventative breast surgery to, uh, because she, she knew she had a higher risk of developing breast cancer, right? So this is genetics. This means the, the sequence of the gene, the, the letters in the gene where uh, like uh, she was carrying a higher risk based on the sequence of the gene. Now, we uh, scientists in the field of epigenetics found out that the same gene, BRCA1, can also uh, be uh, not working actually in the cell because of an epigenetic modification, which means the genetic sequence is, is okay. If you take the test, they will tell you, you don't have the risk variant. But then actually that theoretically working gene is shut down, it is, is turned off. It doesn't work at all in your cells because it has been turned off. So it doesn't work because of an epigenetic modification. So that's how powerful epigenetic is. I, even if you have the best genetics, the best genes, and those genes don't work in the cell, just it's, uh, you know, it's, you are basically uh, <laughs> turning off your genetic potential. And nutritional epigenetics can do the opposite, can turn on 
your genetic potential, can make sure that the good genes you have are actually working for you and not against you. And uh, even the one that are risk variants, actually, you can optimize that function so you can make the best out of it. That's amazing Um, and such a great explanation of the difference. And I guess something that you touched on to maybe give more understanding to those that are new to this topic, you talked about folate and getting the folate from the spinach. What are some of the others you talked about, the breast cancer risk? Like why, I guess, to kind of wrap people's minds up in this properly is... Why is this important? Yeah, this is important because people feel, uh, I think especially now that we, uh, genetic testing is becoming more and more available. There is a lot of uh, misconception and misunderstanding uh, uh, about what this genetic information means for you. And, uh, uh, you know, first of all, uh, most of the genetic reports out there, most of them, if not all, all of them, are a little bit simplistic. They don't really explain that uh, uh, that report is very limited. So people, for example, in my genetic report, the uh, uh, in 23andMe report, according to the report, I am 80% likely to have straight hair. And Leanne, you are free to share my picture. I have, I have a, uh, an Afro-like curly head that I'm very proud about. And all my sisters have those curls. So for sure, there is a, a strong genetic component for, for my curly hair. And yet... 23andMe says I'm 80% likely to to have straight hair. So there is a a higher degree of uncertainty and uh, uh, imprecision in in those predictions. So that's not communicating well. And uh, the second is that uh, these genetic reports can also have the opposite effect of, uh, uh, so can have a, a... you know, people can, on one, one hand, people might feel empowered to take action. This is called a placebo effect to say, okay, I need to eat more folate because I'm not absorbing that. So I will eat more spinach. But on the other, on the other hand, people can also feel uh, discouraged and say, okay, I have bad genes, so, you know, I might as well enjoy life and do what I want. And this is called nocebo effect. It's the opposite. So why this is important? Why is it important to teach people about nutritional epigenetics? Because people can feel empowered. They just need to take ownership of their health. And this is tricky. Sometimes people, you know, th- th- are, are scared also to, to know that they are responsible of their health, right? It's easier to think, ah, I have just good or bad genes. But, you know, I want to make, I want to empower people to say, look, yes, you have the responsibility of your health, but this can be actually an amazing thing. And I want, yeah, I think that's, that's why it's, it's, it's so important. Even in my family, I have, uh, I have family members who are genetically predisposed to have a, a variety of conditions from uh, diabetes to um, uh, uh, hypertension. And, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes they tell me, you know, my doctor told me it's, it's genetic. You know, Lucia, it's, there's no point for me to try a low-carb diet. It, and then I, I tell them, yeah, but those doctors don't know about epigenetics. Let's have a conversation about that. And I, you know, I want, I want really, uh, yeah, just to bring health back in the hands of uh, patients and people who are proactive about, yes, their health and longevity. So what I'm hearing you say is just because I have a DNA report that tells me perhaps I need more omegas doesn't necessarily mean that I actually need more omegas. Would that be? Yes. 
Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm not saying that that's not useful at all. I'm, I am working also with nutrigenetics, looking, uh, et cetera, how these, uh, um, uh, these genetic variants can influence and change whether people uh, absorb uh, and, com- and activate more omega-3s uh, in their bodies or other nutrients. So that's useful, but only in conjunction with other tests. For example, for the omega-3 te- uh, genetic variants that you mentioned. So there are some genetic variants that can influence how much uh, omega 3s we can use from plant based sources you know we know that uh, seeds like chia seeds uh, and flax seeds are very high in so called omega 3s but these omega 3s are precursors so the plant based omega 3s are only inactive uh, let's say precursors to the end products, omega-3s, which are EPA and DHA. These are omega-3s that we find in uh, in marine sources. So like, for example, fatty fish, salmon, uh, for example. And so the point is uh, some genetic variants can affect the way our body uses these plant-based omega-3s to produce the active ones. So it might be that you are eating a lot of chia seeds and flax seeds thinking that you are actually producing the omega-3s your body needs, and because you don't have the, the enzymes the, the, um, that do this work, they do this job functioning properly, you are actually uh, not uh, not getting what you want. So for people who carry the genetic variants that make their omega-3 enzymes weak so that they cannot activate the plant-based omega-3s, those people might be uh, like might want to to supplement with the DHA and the uh, EPA from fish oil, or just uh, uh, increase their consumption of fatty fish. So that's where uh, the genetic nutrigenetics and the nutritional epigenetics work together. So the genetic information can help people pinpoint potential risks and uh, uh, epigenetic uh, uh, information can help people take action on on, uh, those potential risks. But there are other interventions that really uh, uh, require um, like more in-depth uh, uh, genetic uh, analysis because genes work in concert. So looking at only a couple of genes doesn't really mean anything. And a comprehensive uh, uh, functional uh, uh, biomarker testing that really makes sure that actually those genetic predisposition are really working, uh, uh, in, you know, for for the, uh, the patient or against the patient in the body. For example, in the case of omega threes, some people may want to check their omega three levels in the blood before modifying their diet. Now, in this case, if you increase your your consumption of fatty fish, I think most doctors would be fine with that, right? It's not like something that requires a, a lot of uh, uh, physician supervision, but uh, it's just to say that having carrying those genetic variants. Uh, that predispose you to get less omega threes from your plant based ones doesn't actually mean that you really have in your blood low levels of, of omega threes. It depends on other genes you carry, whether you are already eating fatty fish. You know that's that that was what uh, what I am now emphasizing here. Genetic testing is only one component of a more comprehensive functional testing that 
any physician should be doing for their patients. Yes, completely. Something that I've noticed in my practice using functional blood chemistry, which is looking for patterns in blood work, much of those patterns relate to nutrient deficiencies, um, specifically things like iron, B6, vitamin C. And when you adjust that and really figure out the root to those items, B12, another really, really big one, zinc, a lot of that comes back into balance. And it's so interesting. Like I knew nutrients mattered, but they're really essential for ongoing health. I mean, for example, B6, if you don't have enough, the cysteine isn't going to be supported. Your homocysteine can do wacky things that can lead to inflammation. And so, yeah, there's all those precursors to those various things, which when lacking can result in inflammation. And I see that time and time again, using blood chemistry. And I'm glad you touched on just the nutrient piece of things. A lot of the times fixing those nutrients, diet, lifestyle, there's enough, but there's always those fringe clients who are like, okay, we need to do deeper work. And it sounds like when it comes to that and you've exhausted most options, it can be good to kind of get into this work um, to figure out, is there a missing part to the puzzle and what are you working with? I guess you touched on it a little bit of just that feeling of, how am I even supposed to get a handle on this? There's so much wrong. Like I remember going through my genetic report uh, with somebody on the podcast, actually. And she's like, this is going to be kind of boring because everything looks really good. Um, but I know sometimes whether it be in somebody's past, they've had a 23andMe done or something like that. And they hear people talking about genes and they're like, yeah, no, I have no control over this. And this is all just busy work. Uh, what do you maybe have as a message for those people as it relates to this work? Yes. I, I First of all, I understand. I understand there is a lot of confusion among health practitioners, physician, clinicians, and patients, patient, uh, around what, what we can actually do with this information. It's also interesting, but how can we make that actionable? And so I think my first answer is uh, I, the first thing is uh, just setting our expectations. We expect from science, like certainty, like, you know, a, a prescription, but that's, that's, that's not the use of genetic and epigenetic information now in, uh, in medicine is more an indication. So first of all, if we, if we set our expectations, not to say, okay, give me a prescription. No, it's more like, okay, I'm taking this text, the, the tests, because I want to know my biology better. But biology is complex. Science is complex. So the expectation is not, okay, now I get a prescription. It's like, okay, this is a necessary step, necessary step because yes, this is complex stuff, but it's about me. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, I, I want to know more and to get a more precise path, like treatment path, right? So first the expectation and then I think what I am working for uh, clinicians and patients uh, in my uh, in my work is trying to curate this genetic information in a way that I, you know, clinicians will get a sort of scoring system to say, okay, I get this genetic report and I can have the score of how scientific, what is the strength of science associated to that genetic prediction. And there are official guidelines by the Nutrition Nutrigenetic Society that can tell you how strong is the science based on whether that science comes from animal studies, from small human studies, from big human studies. You know, that's the jungle of information out there on genetic reports. You know, you know, you hear about this gene, this gene that, you know, can, can affect your health in this way. But you don't, you don't know whether this is based on a, a, ma a mouse study, <laughs> a study done in mice or a very small human study. You don't have any any way to assess the scientific information. So even clinicians don't have that. So what I'm trying to do in my work is come up with a system, a score that basically one day 
you will have the genetic report, the clinician will read it. So we'll say, and the clinician, the genetic report will aggregate the information from all your genetics for, for example, for a, uh, each pathway. Let's say there is the glucose control pathway. So you will have all your genetic variants computed in sort of score. And I will tell you, you know, there is a, the level of scientific evidence there is uh, uh, five stars or is four stars or three. And uh, your the score of your patient is uh, seven out of 10. And then for those who want to go deeper, then they can go and look at the single genes. You know what I mean? It, it, I think we are now not just scratching the surface, but we need to give patients and practitioners a sort of compass, an instrument to navigate the sea of uh, information about genetics and make sense out of this sea of information. Yeah, completely. Because it can be very overwhelming and really discouraging. So I'm glad you're thinking of that and can provide some insight into that. And wow, this time goes by so quickly. Um, can you tell us a little bit more of the course and things that you have going on, uh, where people can connect with you and uh, some parting wisdom, if you have it on, on what you've shared today? Yes, so I um, so I teach all uh, these courses on epigenetics and uh, um, uh, and genetics at Stanford. I have been uh, teaching for five years uh, professional development certificate courses on uh, on this topic, and uh, I am uh, uh, this year I decided to launch my uh, own course. This is will be the first version of this course open to the public on my own teaching platform. I will be announcing the course launch on my newsletter, so I invite people to subscribe. I will give a, a certification of attendance. Many of my students are now using their uh, epigenetic nutrition certification for their health uh, practice. And uh, I, I want to bring this to more people outside Stanford. And you can learn more about me on my YouTube channel. I, I, I publish many of my lectures at Stanford on my YouTube channel with the top experts in the field of uh, healthy uh, longevity and uh, healthy eating. And uh, uh, again, there my goal is to bring to to break down the sciences in the small bites for people to democratize the science of healthy longevity and living, because I believe that health should be accessible to everybody. That's wonderful. And thank you so much for doing that work out in the world. That's just fantastic. I'll be sure to include all the links to your YouTube and program and, and newsletter and those sorts of things in the show notes. Uh, so if you guys are curious about that, you can just go to ketodietpodcast.com and look for today's episode. And then, yeah, check it out. Or if you're listening to it on a specific player, you should be able to click around and find the show notes directly on that page. Uh, Dr. Arn Aronica, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your brilliance with us. <laughs> thank so you very much. Yeah. 